Hi, and welcome to Show Skaters podcast episode 11. And today we welcome multi talented Kim Manning to our latest episode. Known as the roller skating songstress, Kim has daddled audiences worldwide with her performances alongside George Clinton and the P Funk All Stars. Beyond her musical prowess, she's an accomplished acrobat, actress, and champion artistic roller skater. In this episode, we delve into her journey from skating at the age of three to becoming a professional entertainer. Insights from her touring with the Parliament Funkadelic over a decade, her experience in TV and film, including appearances on Roller Jam, Strange Angel, Westworld and Stump Town. The creation of her comprehensive roller skating program, Skate Like a Pro. Don't miss this inspiring conversation with a true artist who has seamlessly blended skating, music, and performance art. Now let's get into the episode. Hey Kim, how are you doing? It's been a while, how are you? Yes, good, good, good to connect and talk way across the pond, I suppose. Oh, definitely. I mean, how long has it been now since... uh since we're on Vegas. Uh, exactly, exactly. Quite a few years now. Yeah, I bet you feel like you've lived a lifetime since since it was cut since then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we all have, right? Time zones and uh, time warps. It's uh, yeah, uh, been a real little Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, so how, how is the weather out there at the moment? Surprisingly cold, actually. I just got back from Oklahoma. I think it's warmer there than it is here. Yeah. So, uh, oh. Kind of- Frigid and wondering when it's going to be warmer. I bet it's warmer than here. We had our first snow today. It was, oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was just working and I saw the snow coming down. I'm like, that is, that is nice. That is really yeah, nice. No snow. Well, I mean, I saw snow in California and Oklahoma on the way here, but neither of the places that I live. Oh, amazing. Okay, so shall we shall we get down to business? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's open. Let's open the show. All right, so you've been skating since you were three years old, and you actually started competing at five. I did, well, yeah, I mean, I joined the artistic club at five. You know, I got my lessons with my first art coach, and I imagine my first competition didn't happen until I was like six or whatever, but that's when when the competitive skating began. Wow, it's so young, I love it, I love it. Did any of your parents skate? Yeah, my mother was a skater, not an artistic skater, just like a, you know, a regular rink rat. And um, quite honestly, there was really nothing to do in my hometown but the roller rink. There was a putt-putt, like a mini golf, and then there was the roller rink. So one way or another, everyone ended up at the roller rink. I think I just, once I got that, like, the roller skate dress, you know, the figure skate dress, and the five class lesson pass for christmas i was hooked you know no that's fantastic so what do you remember from when you were from when you were younger so you know pre pre pre-18 you know highlights of competing skating being at the rink like paint a picture for us what was it like well um at the time that i was skating we were really trying to become an olympic sport uh artistic figure skating for those of you guys don't know, that's the same thing as figure skating on ice, but in quads. So yeah. we were really quite serious. And I, from, I don't know, from really as long as I can remember, I would be skating 30 hours plus at the rink and wow. just training like a champion, you know? And so I slept at the rink, I ate at the rink, you know, I basically kind of just lived at the rink my entire childhood. And then when I was um, a teenager, that's whenever like our sport got rejected, uh, you know, once more or whatever from the Olympics. And I, at that point was kind of just lost interest, you know, quite honestly. And I was like, got more into doing dance and, you know, I was already doing music, but got more focused on music and theater and acting. And so I kind of moved my energies into dancing and cheerleading and acrobatics and stuff. Wow. I did not know that about you. But it, it's so it's so sad, even to this day, roller skating's not in the Olympics. You know, when I started ice skating, I felt like I understood why. 
because with ice skating, your spins are like so much faster and the jumps are so much higher and it's just everything. Mm. I don't know. You know there's there's some really really fast spinning skates. I know, there. but I can guarantee if they got on ice, you would be like, "Oh my god!" It's just it's so much like you know it's you know roller quad skating is like created to mimic what ice skating was naturally, right? You know there was like since the age of time ice skating, and then quad skating was like a in the 1700s, 1800s they started creating. A mechanical version to mimic the ice and you can feel it and I, I just think that from a um outside perspective view they 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 i think that the average customer like can't they don't understand how much more substantially harder what a quad you know if a quad skater does a quad jump that's substantially harder you know yeah. because of the weight of the skate and i don't think that it comes across to the audience and that's why I mean, that's just what I'm thinking because it would be beneficial to everyone. It would be beneficial to the ice skaters because, you know, you guys could go ice for the Olympics in the winter and then move into inliner quad for the summer. You know, it would be, it really is, makes, that's the only thing I can come up with because otherwise yeah. it makes no sense, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about the weight of skates for a second on quads. Like something they've noticed, even like the itty bitty, they have like the same size wheels, the same size trucks for small kids. It, it, is this not strange? Do you think? That yeah, I think about that. Like when I found, when I was cleaning up my mom's house and I found my, I, they must be like my first art skates, you know? And they were like this big and it was just like nothing but truck and wheels, you know? They yeah. were almost heavier than my ideas now, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, it was exactly. like, yeah it's hard for a little it's hard for a little kid roller skaters i tell you <laughs> exactly maybe maybe a company's going to do something about that <laughs> hey, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> i often think of them as my ball and chain you know my roller skates they like they let me fly but they're like always attached to me and they're always heavy and i'm always yeah i jumped with ash i jumped with ash the other day i said you might not be able to do a coughing with our skates because they're substantially lighter than what you're used to. You won't have that counterbalance, you know? So this is gonna, it's gonna be interesting to see some of the things that uh, aren't possible anymore because you're used to a counterbalance. Yeah, it's absolutely true. A uh, cough one I can do. I, I did one on an Instagram post not so long ago. Um, but like my elbow stand, for example, I got so used to doing them with my skates that when I would take off my skates, I always, it's like, uh, I have to recalibrate the balance, you know, cause it's yeah. like, oh wait, oh, I gotta go more this way, you know? And similarly, like on Roller Jam, um, whenever Junior and I did that backbend um, trick, I don't know, Trey and I call it U-turn, some people call it backbend, whatever you call it. Um, I was in my Deus versus my Harlex. And the ideas are so much lighter that it totally affected like the way it felt for me to get into it, you yeah. know, because you just get used to working with the, that weight. And so when that weight becomes less, you know, even my elbow stand feels different with the ideas. In fact, and I noticed like <laughs> in roller jam that like my split was here instead of here, but it's because of I'm not, I'm used to the heavier skate pulling mm -hmm. me down and me having to pull up to counter, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, that's, it is, it's true. There's a reality in that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's tough. You kind of get used to a certain weight and when it changes, then it's, you have, it's almost like relearning again, isn't it? Mm hmm it sure is it's like yeah. relearning yep yeah okay, and so, it's obviously so with an ice skate being much lighter oh i mean yeah they, there's no wheels they got, they're going to be lighter aren't they yeah and no trucks and no, yeah. and yeah. no you know all those parts that we got yeah so you just re you just mentioned uh roller jam so um i'd love to to hear all about it like how was the experience to to perform on roller jam well amazing i mean it, and it feels like it's still going uh, i just got to perform for the reality tv awards show uh, representing wow. roller jam yeah it was really exciting and uh alicia and jamelin from the show also came and skated with me so it's like wow it feels like it's i like i can't believe it's a dream um they contacted me from RollerCon, where i was teaching stunts 
And immediately I knew I wanted to put together a stunt team. You know, it had to be, I, I didn't, you know, obviously I could have invited any skaters, but I was very specific that I wanted people that not only knew how to do stunts, but also knew how to skate, you know? Yeah. And um, so uh, it was just, I feel like I'm sure you know how difficult it is to get that like type of a group together. And so I just am so overjoyed and appreciative of Magnolia for like allowing me to create that space to put that vision and like for us to put out five different, you know, performances and just, oh, I'm over the moon about it. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that was, must have been uh, a lot of rehearsals. No, no, not really, actually. So um, we originally had uh, like, a, it was like a list of guys that we went through that ended up having, uh, you know, by the time the show happened, people would have conflicts, you know, because we're busy individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when we we went into the show finalized with Ryan Sorello um, and he was unavailable. And then we couldn't find, we had to have someone with a US passport, as you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and so we couldn't find anyone with a US passport that we could put on the show. So we decided to go a different direction and bring in like a jam skater. And so that was really fun and a, like, you know, a nice incorporation and kind of allowed me to base more, which was really quite cool. But um, so by the time that we got our group together, basically we were given half of my group lived in Vegas and then half of my group was in LA. And so we had a two day rehearsal time period in which I actually went up a day early and did like a three yeah. hour stunt rehearsal. So we had um, 16 hours, which kind of ended up being 14, you know, 13 because of lunch breaks and whatnot. And um, coming into that, what I did was meet up with Cardell and, and we really needed, I felt we needed his, his skate style and his dance style. So like him and I like facilitated creating a bunch of choreo bits kind of like with, we didn't know what decade was going to come when or whatever, but we we're just like, we didn't know what song, but we were just like, you know, just let's put on a 90s song, something that like I could see inspired him. And then like watch him move around and be like, okay, let's count that out and let's add this, you know? And so we created a bunch of choreo bits and then um, we took uh, some choreo that I had created with Ash and Junior earlier when I was in Vegas for another event. And um, I put together the like first show format and, Cardell kind of like skated it through with me, even though he doesn't, stunts are completely new to him, but I was just like, okay, just pretend, hold my hand, pretend somebody's flying, you know, just so I yeah. can time it all out, you know? And um, so when we went into that rehearsal, I basically had a game plan already for all five routines. Um, I talked with Junior about the stunts that him and Ash did and which ones he thought were you know, most amazing. And then I um, knew which stunts that I thought that I should do that, you know, were sort of signature stunts that I do and stunts that him and I could do. Um, and uh, so then I kind of made like a, a format of like, okay, for the first episode, we'll do these stunts. For the next episode, we'll do these stunts. And like, I have like a backlog, I'm sure you do, of like uh, group stunts and stuff. So I, you know, talked to him and kind of made a game plan of like, let's try these group stunts and we'll throw these group stunts in these five shows. So I basically came with the five shows planned. And so within that 13 hours, we did um, two hours each day of stunt rehearsal. So it was like, you know, two seven hour rehearsals, right? We did two hours of stunt rehearsal. And then we had the additional five hours in which I pushed them through the five pieces, which yeah. there was a lot of like moaning and groaning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they were not happy. And I was like, and I got stressed, you know, because like I've done reality TV a lot. And I knew when you got on set, there'd be no time for any of this. And so that's why I came so prepared and so like, but yeah, so I pushed through the, the moaning and groaning and was like, no guys, like, it's like, if you, you know, we got all but one piece done in that time period. And then while we were on set, we had about an hour and a half on our skates in a floor space 
that was without cameras to rehearse. And our time period always seemed to be getting cut. <laughs> you know, like yeah. we always ended up having to do an interview where we get split. So it'd be like 30 minutes and then 40 minutes later or something, you know. Um, maybe everyone's experience was the same. I don't know. But then like, and then we had an additional like 30 minutes on the floor, but the producers were there and the cameras were there and the lights were there. And then you had your dress rehearsal and then your shoot. So you had about, you know, per, per episode, an additional two hour total rehearsal. Yeah. Broken up. Oh, that seems, that seems that I'm tired. I'm tired just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because the thing is we were on set all day, like yeah. from 8 a.m. to like 11 or 12 every day. And yet you only got to skate that little. But a lot of times you had your skates on because you were doing the interviews or you were doing costume yeah. fitting, or you're out in the floor, uh, you know, setting up for lights and things like that. You know, there was like so you were. And which was like very hard. Like uh, as an art skater, you understand like I'm in an Idea Fly, which is a hard skate. So I got like a crazy blister just from having to stand so long, you know, which was actually by the final episode, I could tell I was in a lot of pain from that blister, you know? So, you know, that was, uh, there was a lot of like TV's hard in a lot of different ways and unexpected ways. I yeah, guess. I mean, it's always good to come through it and look and looking back and just remember the, the good things because there's nothing's perfect, right? You know, there you go. Well, that's 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 you sound like my counselor, and yeah. you're absolutely right, nothing's perfect. And like the mere fact that in the, those of us that made it through to the finale, like we're still skating, and to be honest, I was kind of like one of the ones last men standing, like everybody else was barely able to stand up. Even the young people, yeah. you know, the 20 year olds were like, you know, had the thera, thera bumper things and like, you know, moaning and groaning. So it was, it was physically demanding without any time to rehearse. So if you can kind of imagine that combination, that's what it was like. Oh, definitely. So uh, have you done any other TV shows then? I think you mentioned some yeah, other shows. Yeah, yeah. What I have you done? Well, I was on a little TV show called Flavor of Love. Do you remember it? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, it was um, back in the early 2000s and uh, like 2006, um, 7, 8, something like that. So I guess not that early. And it like then became Rock Love and all those other of love shows. But um, Was it skating? No, no. Oh, wow. I was trying to date a rapper. And um, okay. yeah, it was kind of like, uh, it was, you know, it broke all of VH1's records. It was a phenomenon at its time. And wow. I played a character named, well, I was myself, but he yeah. gives us crazy names and my name was Peaches. So okay. I was Peaches on that show. And I did skate. Yeah. A little bit though. Yeah. Interesting. So after spending over a decade singing and touring with George Clinton's parliament, Funkadelic, what was that like? And what inspired you to transition into teaching roller skating? Is that kind of the path that it took or? Yeah, I would say with like circus and stunts in the middle. Um, so yeah, I was really lucky to get to be a member of George Clinton Parliament Funkadelic. Um, you know, a lot of people might not know that name, but they know the music. We want funk. You're like, I know. <laughs> oh, I know the music. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know the name. Oh, I know the music. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Right. Yeah. Or like, I make my funk a pee funk. I want to get funked up. Or mm. ain't no party like a pee funk party because a pee funk party don't stop. There you go. So, George is um, sort of the the genetic start of what became hip hop, you know, he's like in between jazz and hip hop and American music. And, um, you know, that's where funk lies and to be a funk musician and travel with them for all those years. And it also set me up for my roller skate career because George basically when they was because we were in Amsterdam and George sent me to get my hair done. He wanted me to get the colorful braids mm -hmm. in my hair because we were getting ready to do a, a TV event. It was at the it was in Switzerland, the TV event, Life from Montro. You can buy the DVD, whatever. Yeah. And um I remember to get to the event, I, I had had my roller skates with me. So I skated to the hair place and then I skated from the hair place to the show and George happened to be outside and he saw me and he was like, Hey, um, can, you know, is there any way that you can wear those on stage? 
And honestly, I had never, I, I, you know, as a figure skater, this is probably normal. Like I never thought anyone would want to see me skate, you know, like I was like, you mean people would want to watch me skate? Like I just, you know, I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we're so stuck in what we can't do or what we're working mm -hmm. on or like the places we didn't go. Like, oh, I never, I never made world class. You mean people want to watch me skate? You know, you're like, I was never an Olympian. Are you sure people want to watch me skate? You know, and so, um, so yeah. So I started skating again because I am. And I started skating on stage and oh, then goosebumps. Like no, I know. It's that, kind of amazing. That is such a pivotal moment in your skating career. If you didn't go on your skates that day, maybe you would never have seen you. You may never have skated then. And your life would have gone Absolutely. on a totally or, different path. That's right. Or if he wouldn't have been sitting outside by the bus, something he never does. Yeah. He's like normally on the bus or backstage, but for some reason he was like enjoying the sun that day in Amsterdam or whatever. Whoa, oh my God. So from that point on, you were in the show skating? Yeah, yeah. So I was already, you know, a singer in the show, but from that point on, I was also a roller skater. <laughs> and there became like a joke too, where like, you know, if um, like we were like learning a dance or whatever, because George had all these little dances. You yeah. know, and like, you know, I'd be like the white girl over there trying to learn it. And then George would be like, oh, get on your skates and try it. And so then it that like that joke continued on to the point where like if we're in the studio singing and like I'm not getting the part or the note exactly like he wants, he'll be like, go get your skates on and sing it. You know, it was like it was like, just go put on your skates and everything will be OK. Kim gets cool. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like not cool Kim without the skates. And then there's cool Kim with the skates. <laughs> oh, and how, how old would you have been at this point? Gosh, I was in my 20s. I was because it wasn't my first year in the band or so, but so I was still in my early 20s. And um, so I quit skating like around 15, which is like or 16. And that's when I focused on acrobatics and dance and acting. And then, you know, I got a degree in music theater in which nobody knew I could roller skate through that entire <laughs> process. And then it was a year or so after that I graduated college that, you know, I started skating again with P-Funk. Oh my God. Like blend, blending different, different skills together. I think this is, this, this is so important and, and so much, so much more interesting, you know, when you do have different skill sets, like of all, all the different skill sets that you've had, like what have you actually blended together with your singing, your dancing and. All your, of it. I know. You know I that's what I do. I'm like Mrs. McBlend, I guess. Like, <laughs> you know, if you don't have enough time to, um, you know, master one thing, you know, just uh, go ahead and, you know, put them all together or something and no one will notice. And make something interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did see you doing some, some stuff with a seer wheel. I know. Isn't that fun? You have a seer wheel too. So... Yeah. Did you ever play around with it with your skates? No, I just put it on the floor and used it as a as a, a table. Because it's well, like even one, that isn't it. It was one point one point eight meters, so I'm like, okay, this this is kind of this kind of works. It's a bit small, yeah. but it works. But visually, it looks good. Yeah, yeah, I mean, thanks. I so I started. Um, I saw a girl in the seer wheel actually. I worked for the circus Lucent Dozier and we did the Grammys and this was eons ago and dream the owner of that circus is the first one that showed me images of people that do this the stunt act that we do and um, <clears throat> I was like man like it was like the little like 1800s Chinese like lady ones you know I'm sure you've seen them right and it was like whoa like black and white footage grainy the whole thing right and so that was like when I first kind of wanted to do what we do, but obviously finding a partner is very difficult, right? 10 years plus to figure that out. But also there was a girl doing the seer wheel there, Sarah. And I was just like, oh my God, like, what is this thing? It was like magic to me. And I, it, it and hair suspension that are two things that like, I sort of saw, I saw hair suspension when I was like six. And that was the first time I kind of knew I wanted to fly, like period, 
you know, but I didn't get back to hair suspension until 10 years after doing aerial training. And, you know, similarly with the sear wheel, it wasn't until like well being established in the circus arts that I finally got back to the, yeah. you know, it was almost like I was like, oh, like they look so fun. And I was like, it was too good to be true. It took me that long to get to it. But um, I love the sear wheel and it's, very difficult with the skates, you know, it's definitely like, Oh, I can imagine. It's a bit of a math problem, you know, in the works, just like, but it also, you know, is kind of like a cheat too, because, you know, I don't, I, 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 for a long time, didn't want to, to perform with the seer wheel. In fact, the roller jam production asked for me to bring it back for the finale. Yeah. And I was like, too lack of confidence. And, then when Perfect Angels asked me to bring it out for their performances, I was like, now's the time I need to practice because everybody keeps asking for it. And I keep, you know, lacking confidence because true to being a figure skater, you know, you see what you can't do versus what you can do. Right. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, I don't do coin rolls yet. And my spinning inside is not that good. But but finally, I just succumbed to the fact that actually just me skating around really quite simply and spinning it, you know, it is very risky and, you know, it is very visually pleasing to people. So, Oh, it is. I mean, it's one thing I always wanted to try. Uh, I have tried German wheel. Uh, I was oh, you do? Practicing, I was practicing with a partner oh, back in 2010 or something. To, I wanted to do it on the ice because uh, we wanted to just a way to be an act as opposed to yeah. just principle and we yeah. were training in, in Hungary and it was going well until I started to learn the penny roll and then I was doing it and then it f I fell out of it and then it went upside down the other way and just missed my head and I'm like yeah I'm done I'm like I'm done you know it's I haven't learned this from the beginning correctly and we're just trying to fast track this uh, is when accidents happen I'm like done out I'm out. You know. I mean, it's like the German wheel's like the mother of the seer wheel, you know, and I'm sure yeah. you'd actually be pretty good with the seer wheel just from that German wheel experience. But yeah, like the the penny roll or the coin roll, like I'm so like not looking forward to the moment that I've graduated to the point that I just have to start trying to do it because you know, <laughs> like it's dangerous and yeah, that wheel's big. It's heavy and it's big. And, you know, the moment, like when I'm performing with other people that what we did for the reality TV awards was I brought the seer wheel and Alicia and Jamlin were skating and I was singing. And, you know, I had to tell them like, you guys, like anyone that's like in the room with me in the wheel, they have to know the wheel is dangerous. Yeah. It doesn't have a brain. It's going to do its own thing. You know, we're going to do our, I'm pretty decent at, making it do what i want it to do but you never know yeah, like always, <laughs> sometimes it's just gone I feel, yeah. like, I feel like my partner sometimes they just yeah <laughs> like it just takes like a little like moment of like you, me pushing the wrong direction or something and it's going to go into an orbit and be where you thought you were supposed to skate so you better go ahead and just move your little booty away because it is not gonna counter for you you know yeah oh for sure <laughs> So let's kind of segue into into coaching. So how how did how did you go from you know traveling the world, singing and skating to then when did coaching come into your life and why did it come into your life? Yeah, great question. So um, <clears throat> I uh, started you know at, like with as as you know I was singing in with George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic for fifteen years and then from there. I went through the circus. So I started kind of the end of my music career. I started really training trapeze, silks, and then that led me into training contortion. And um, whenever I was training those is whenever I met Trey and Trey Knight. And then Trey Knight obviously is versed in doing the stunts. And so then him and I started working together as a stunt duo. And so now all of a sudden I thought I left my band to focus on my solo music career, but ended up becoming a circus artist and roller skater instead, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so then COVID hit and Trey got sick. He um, was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, so when I started noticing all the roller skaters on the internet, 
you know, and in particular, I saw people teaching like not to stop doing the tea, stop dragging the toe, you know, saying that you'd break your ankle doing that. Like I couldn't handle it anymore. And I was like, oh my God, like these people need help. Someone needs to teach these, you know, the world, like everyone's trying to skate. They're all putting on skates and they've got people that have just been skating for like two years and trying to teach them how to skate. And this is like very dangerous situation. And I need to figure out a way to help. Yeah. And so I just started like sort of getting blessed with inspirations on ways to communicate to people how to skate via little short videos. And a lot of that came from my background as a mechanical engineer, which is what I studied in college, um, as well as, um, you know, I'm a, a triple certified yoga instructor. So like kind of the combination of I was able to use sort of my physics training and calculus training to like kind of draw out things so that people mm. could understand them. You know, like I could teach, I was like teaching skating through math or math yeah. through skating, you know, I'm not sure which way it was. And so that combination just really kind of worked. So it was kind of another weird time in my life whenever the blending sort of came into play. Oh, so interesting. And I, I, I had similar, I went through something similar as well during COVID and started teaching a little bit. But I, I wish I'd, from the beginning, started creating more videos on one channel that I made. I, I did it later, but actually when I came to Poland. But it's, it's so fun once you start doing it and then you start thinking, oh, what else could I teach? How would I do that video? Then you have the idea and then you try to shoot it. And it, it, it's actually, it's, it's quite fun, isn't it? It really is. Like every morning I'd wake up with like boom, 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 like three ideas. And I'd write them in my phone and then I would kind of coagulate them into sets of 10 on shoot days. And I would do like the 10 that kind of could fit together, you know, in shooting. And, um, you know, it was a very inspiring time for me. Um, and I also appreciated, it became obviously even more inspiring whenever I had my program, the Skate Like a Pro program, where it was like a full, it's a full program to teach someone how to skate, like, you know, no matter where you live. And a lot of that comes from me being from a very small town. And all we did have was skating, you know, and I'm so grateful for that. My coach traveled like two hours, you know, to come teach us. Yeah. And, you know, I'm so grateful for that. And I recognize that, you know, people, that, very few people in small towns even have that opportunity. And so I was like, if I was a person living, you know, in a small town with no, no ice skate rink nearby and no artistic clubs, you know, and I wanted to learn how to skate, you know, you know, how could I teach those people? And so that's why I created the whole program. And it's kind of, it's very intensive. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a short break whilst I talk about show skaters. Show Skaters is a platform I have created with the goal to build a global skating community. It's also filled with a learn to skate course, lots and lots of tutorials for inline figure skating. There's a whole how to section for the gym with all exercises covered. And one of the goals is to have all of the castings and everything in there once it really, really starts to grow. Because once one blades comes out, this will be the hub for all of the affiliates. So this will be the easiest way for me to, you know, to just discuss opportunities and uh, exciting things for the affiliates to be working on and different marketing that we will do directly with them. And the best part about it, it's free to join. So join up, create your bio, get your badges, and then we'll form a great community and we will change the world of skating together. If we all work together, we can do great, great things. Now back to the show. So let's let let's talk a little bit about like skate like a pro. So uh, like why why do you think it's important for skaters to start with the fundamentals and not just kind of start with what they want to learn? Um that's a great question, right? Because a lot of people they really want to just start with the tricks, you know, like and I'm sure you know as a skater, like 
you'll be at the rink and you'll be skating. And it's like when you do the camel spin that people come up, hey, can you teach me that? And you're like, well, <laughs> you should have came to me when I was just doing like T-Sop, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, I can teach you that, you know. So it's funny how people always want to learn like the most, your most, it's like when you do your most advanced trick, that's when everyone wants to come learn it. Um, so it's really important. I mean, exactly what you said with your German will is the perfect example for a skater, roller or ice. And I think in ice, it's just kind of known. And if you get in an ice rink, someone is going to see your talent and direct you to a coach. And that's like, if someone comes up to you and they like are like, hey, have you ever thought about taking lessons? Like you shouldn't, I feel like a lot of roller skaters are like offended by that. But actually like in the ice world, you know, in this, the history of skating, that would mean that someone sees your talent and they want you to like be your best and they, yeah. they want you to get some education so that you can get your physics in line because of, it's like a 300 year old, you know, plus technique. It's not anything that's new and invented and it's literally based on physics and calculus and, you know, scientific, it's a scientifically proven, <laughs> you know, situation. So, um, you know, and you don't want to be in a position like you were with your German will, where you start doing those more advanced tricks and then you get almost hurt or hurt and you realize now I'm screwed because yeah. I can't go back and reteach myself all those fundamentals. It's going to be so difficult to undo all my bad habits. And that's exactly what happens in skating. I know you know it, like the double leans where people's axes are doing this action instead of them being like this. And, you know, they're spinning like this. And once they get to a point, they can't spin any faster, any more rotations. And the only way to get that is to get your axis off the double lean and into one single axis on the appropriate edge. And to teach your body to do that after you taught it wrong for however long you've been skating is very difficult process well definitely i mean there's a reason that you learn to walk before you learn to run right yeah you know, there's, right. there's a reason you have a program and you follow it in order you don't go oh i'll do this and i'll go here you know because you can't do that without learning this and a lot of people don't want to put the time in so the beginning is where it's boring and then you learn progression 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 and i imagine this is how your uh your program is and your modules and everything is divided between your fundamentals and your intermediate and your advanced and your stretch. Uh, can you explain kind of the progression in some of those for me a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for anyone that's interested, they can download my ebook uh, for free and it like writes out the progression of the different moves that you should uh, accomplish as well as like what you should be doing before you move on to the next step so um and a lot of people like probably in their brain are already like oh i can do a two foot spin and i can this and that i'm intermediate but that's actually not what it's about it's like can you hold the outer forward and um you know forward inner edge for 15 seconds on one foot you know like that's that's a progression not can you throw yourself into a trick, you know, it's, do you have control of the edges? And so the fundamentals is all about sort of your basic forward skating and just your learning the T-stop, learning different stops, learning how to fall, cannonball, shoot the duck, um, the baby two foot, learn to step, toe, heel toe, two foot spin. Um, so it's really the foundations to me, the fundamental course in my program is like, in my mind, I sort of geared it to people who would consider themselves an intermediate or advanced skaters or somebody that even had like a lot of dance or yoga background, you know, um, because it is the fundamentals of skating. It's not, that's why it's not called like um, beginner program because it's, it's yes, good for beginners, but if you consider yourself an advanced skater, you should still start at the found fundamentals and see where your fundamentals are at. And then once you've accomplished some edge control and forward skating, then you can move into the intermediate, which is your backward skating, your turning around, and then some of your basic tricks, your bunny hops, your two foot spins, um, 
cross pulls, we start to go over, you know, and then the advanced is your hard inside backwards edges, right? And then moving into like really just simple spins, two foot spins. I do a one foot spin. Uh, I do a waltz jump. I think I do like a half mapes. So what would be for us as artistic skaters would be kind of like your beginning, right? Your yeah. beginning artistic skating is the advanced module. And I thought about creating more advanced modules. I even have some things like illusions, cartwheels. Um, I do like dips. I do moves that are not just artistic skating, but also like show skating. So it kind of gives like a combination coffins in there, you know, things like that. Coffin into splits, you know, which is like more of like a show move. Um, so it's a combination of the, of the two a little bit when you get into the trick side of it. That's why it's like a pro, not skate like a world champion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not a world champion, but I am a pro. And yeah. you know, it's teaching you how to like be a performer, you know, is yeah. really the, no, it's, the, a, it's a great name. I like the name Skate Like a Pro. It's uh, it's very brandable. It's great. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I mean, I really made it out of just the awareness that I'm not like a world champion, you know, like the you know the awareness that. I'm creating a program that's more for professionals than it is for people that are trying to be competitive skaters. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So how, how do you measure success as a, te a teacher or a performer? Um, you know, when I started teaching online and then there's been a few moments that I could tell that like I felt very successful in. And um, one of them, I was back in Oklahoma, actually, and I was at um, this rink in Sand Springs, which is um, actually owned by the Collier family, and they are figures, they're artistic skaters. So there's an artistic skater involved with that rink, I know, you know, an old artistic skater. He was more speed, I think, was, you know, became his focus. But regardless, so I saw these um, girls out in the center, and they had some nice little, like, bowers, and they were, like, doing some really good skating and i could tell you know i was like oh you know maybe the collier family's coming and they're giving lessons because these girls clearly have had someone train them they have some kind of figure skating training and you know i was so impressed so i went up to them and i was like you know wow you guys are really good like where did you learn to skate from and they both just like got so red and they were like from you and I was like from me and they're wow. like yes we follow you and try everything you show us and this is the things we've learned from you and I was just like I couldn't oh. believe it I was like oh my god like proving the pudding like it's working you know the program's actually working these little girls like learn something you know oh my god and oh, I know amazing. isn't that amazing I was just oh. like wow and then there was another time when we were doing the Barbie movie, actually, and um, there was that was like a paparazzi frenzy. The Barbie movie. I've you never were, experienced you anything. You were in the, you were in the Barbie movie as well. Yeah, yeah. I cast the roller skaters and choreographed the roller skaters for that. Oh, you didn't you didn't mention that before? That's that's amazing. You know, I know. I, right? only, I only just watched that when I flew back here a month ago. No, no, when I flew back from Qatar. I loved it. I was so shocked okay. that I loved it. It was so fun. It was just well, fun. So, I mean, you know, everything's so fast, but we're sort of the first thing you see when they come, they skate on to Venice. There's like, you know, I spin around on my little toe stop spin. And, and then the, like the rest of us are kind of weaving in and out on that scene when they're rollerblading. And then like when they, they leave, like we're doing a little four person stunt, like a pinwheel with like splits at the end, like where the last thing you see is they like evolve off into the clouds. So it's pretty cool. Like we're basically the, you know, I'm like the representative of you've entered the real world when you see me skating around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, but yeah, when we were there shooting it, it was just like crazy. I've never, like we showed up on set at 8 a.m. And then by 11, we were already in memes, like on the internet, like Yahoo and, you know, like ESPN. It was like, I've never experienced anything like that. It was crazy. But a lot of people, you know, coming up and talking to us and whatever. And I remember in particular, uh, this one person came up and um, they started like singing, um, Cannonball, before you fall, 
can and mama for you fall. Yeah. You know? And I was like, hey, that's my tune. And she's like, yeah, I sing it every time I fall or every time I'm skating. So I know I'm not going to fall. And I was just like, <laughs> wow, okay. Like, you know, that's awesome. Like I'm helping people. So, you know, the, I would say those were like the two times that I was like, all right, like I'm actually making a difference, you know, in people's lives. Wow, that's that's amazing. So it's, it's could be a similar question, but I, I'm not sure. So what's a performance or project or lesson you've designed that you're particularly proud of? Uh, I would say roller jam, you know, for sure, is something that I'm I feel is like a representation of the vision I have. Now, obviously, you know, we lost Junior. Um, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, you know, towards the end, uh, I would say my plans changed, but even those performances I'm proud of, but in particular, the first performance, um, I'm like, and the second performance, and the third performance, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, but really like the first performance, like I, that one, like, like came from my little head and I just feel like really grateful for it and so grateful for the talented skaters that were able to do it i know for ashton jr doing the um hammer dance was very difficult yeah. they were like they they're not americans i don't know you're you're not either so maybe I don't, I don't know you might know the hammer dance though because of you know you were alive when it happened but for the americans when we saw the hammer dance that was like pure magic that kind of like changed things for us <laughs> like so I was like, no, we have to do the hammer dance. You know, it was like a real, that one was a real fight. But, I, think you should, I think you should show us the hammer dance now. Just give us a few beats. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, you can almost like see it, but it's like where you're doing this and you're like, and then he moves across. He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you remember it now, right? Yeah. And it was like magic. You're supposed to move all the way across the stage. I didn't win that battle, but, you know, we yeah. still got it in. Ironically, like Magnolia showed it as like the example of like the 90s when they showed the different decades. They like, they didn't show our stunts. Instead, they showed us doing the hammer dance. Yeah. The hammer dance was magic, y'all. Oh, interesting. I don't, I don't think I've actually done the hammer dance. I have seen it, though. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I have to do it. Them, they never yeah. seen it. They didn't understand. Yeah. They were like, "What?" Yeah. And I can get it. Like if you're not, if you weren't a lot, you know, you're. I could see how they're right. Like, you know, without context, it is kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the best things are, though, aren't they? <laughs> yes, exactly. So here's here here's a great question for you. And obviously, 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 apart from me, if you could perform with anyone. Or teach anyone, like, who would it be, dead or alive? Like, who is your, like, let's do perform first. Like, if you could perform with someone, who would that be? It could be a singer, it could be anyone. Right, I know. That's, like, that. that's a difficult list. And obviously, like you said, you would be my first yeah. choice. <laughs> but, um, yeah, jeez. That's hard when you're, like, a multi-artist like me because, you know, I, I mean, depending on what type of performance that I'm doing, but I guess what's coming off the top of my head would be um, the gentlemen that you did a interview with recently that have been stunting with each other. Oh, Zabato and Alejandro. Yes, yeah, they, they look like so yeah, much fun. <laughs> that, that would be fun. You know what would be really, really fun? It's like, it's something I've always thought about and I, I always have these plans and these different things and then my life takes a turn and I would love was one day just imagine a, a retreat somewhere acrobatic roller skaters and you end up getting a lot of people there you know and you went like 50 60 people there and you just you just doing tricks or stunts with each other and you're trying to do different things something like that would be so fun wouldn't it so fun and I mean I feel like that you and I are always kind of on that same kick where we're like, but how can we make it bigger and more extreme? You're like, you know, we're like, this is great with two people, but can we do it with six? You know, like, oh, definitely. You know, like, was, <laughs> like when I when I went to Qatar and they lost my skates and I put I did the act without skates. Yes, I saw those videos. You know, it's like uh, no, that's not nothing I ever want to do in my life. Yeah, like, you know. Oh never never again like i lost my skates once checking them in back you know when i toured with p-funk you know in europe we did a different city every day so it was a flight every day 
And um, I did come to the point where I just had to put my skates and my carry on. I never, ever check them in because. No. Well, yeah. I no normally would never check them in, but just because I had, I had to have my spray with me. So I had to, I had to check that. And I'm like, I might as well put my skates in there. Oh, Another yeah. Time, I'm going to have a little, you know, something small that I can put my spray into. There's enough there. And then it's un mm -hmm. under the, the amount that we can take through. And yeah. We'll I mean, I'm not planning to perform again uh, anyway, any, any, any time soon. Wow. The next times I'll perform is if when we have our skates and we're going to big events around the world, then I'll perform. I'll have, you know, but that that's another thing for now. I need to build it first. I need to build it. Then we get to that stuff down the road. So, <laughs> so Zabato and Alejandro, I'll make it happen. All right, let's do it. I'll let's make it happen this. one day and I'll stand out. That people like, hey. retreat. I'll make it happen one day. So uh, what's the surprising talent or hobby that you have that nobody that knows about? Because I feel like everybody knows, but they don't because not everyone sees everything you do. I see nothing anyone does, even though everyone must think I'm online all the time. I don't watch what anyone does. I'm too busy. So right. that'll be something. It's so true. Something it's cool. hard to like. And there's like the there's a world of people that know me as a musician that don't know I roller skate. And then there's a world of people that know me as a roller skate that don't know I'm a musician. You know, they're like literally two different worlds that rarely meet. Um, but as far as the talent that I have that people don't wouldn't expect gardening, I think I'm a really good gardener. Actually, I can kind of sort of make anything bloom and keep the bugs away. And I know all the tricks and oh really mm -hmm. interesting gardening can you cook yes i'm a great baker as well I'm, i have a lot of uh, dietary restricts i bet a lot of people do that do what we do i know almost all the contortionists i know do we're all like gluten-free and so you know i have a lot of dietary restricts but so i do cook a lot uh, what's your favorite meal well my favorite food's mashed potatoes <laughs> really how how do you make it you've, you've got to be jazzing it up with something how do you do it well i you know if it's my preference i would do like a kind of normal mashed potato give some cream you know give some dairy to it and butter obviously and salt and then um but it's really about the gravy right and so then i would make like a gluten-free roux you know like but okay. i mean i call it that but i'm from the south so it's probably not like the way the French would make their roux. I mean, it probably is, but I imagine we'd probably burn ours a lot darker. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the difference. <laughs> and, then, and then I make the gravy out of that. Oh, interesting. Oh, now I'm hungry. I, I, love, I love to eat so much. The food here in Poland is so good. It's so oh, yeah. I had some amazing food when I was in Poland. Oh, amazing. So if you, if you, if you, your life had been totally different. You hadn't performed. You hadn't teach, taught, teach, taught. You hadn't taught nothing. What do you think you would have done? Where do you think your life, a lawyer? Uh, or you, you did say you, you were a mechanical engineer. You think you would have gone down that path? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> my I was a double major in mechanical engineering and music theater. Um, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, actually. And so I thought, but to be honest, um, you know, I've been lamenting for years. Oh, I should have made that choice. It would have been so much easier. I was once smart, you know? <laughs> um, and then recently, sadly, one of my, my ex-boyfriends who was a astrophysicist, um, he passed away. And so I went to his funeral and reconnected with all of my friends that I went to college with, you know, and it was like, they're all um, a couple astrophysicists and a doctor in biochemistry and a doctor in astro astro atmospheric sciences. And um, another one that specializes in laser fusion. So these are the people that I was like studying with and they all went and became like, they're all, you know, and I, was, just, like, I just feel like a monkey. Like, Doctor, 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 doctor Kim. Oh doctor. my God. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, but the thing was, is in talking to them, like if I went through this whole process of like, God, my life would have been so much easier. They all have like families and houses and a second house and, you know, just normal ish lives, you know? And like I really lamented my sort of choices, you know, a little bit. But then I also, the more that I spoke to them, 
like I began to like realize like a lot of them were working um, in like right away sort of working for projects for the government, which were things that they didn't believe in. So they had to like quit those jobs, but it was only after like six months of helping build things that maybe could be destructive to life, you know, and like, um, or similarly, even some of them that ended up doing aerospace engineering, like they, um, you know, every time they would build a new thing for an airplane and a test pilot had to test it, like they couldn't even sleep the night before because what happens if their engineering was wrong and then that test pilot dies and it's like totally your fault, you know? And I really thought about that and I was like, oh, like, you know, I guess with every every career path when you're a young person and you're like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, you kind of see the positive side. And then when you start to do it, you get acclimated into the negative sides. And like, I think that with the engineering in my brain, I, I had yet to sort of recognize the negative side until that experience. And then I was like, actually... I don't think that my my stress levels would have been happy in a life like that, like knowing that that's, you know, people's lives were literally dependent on me. You know, it's, it's hard enough what, what we do, you know, one person's life is dependent on me, you know, it's another thing to know, you know, bigger. Like, yeah. Oh, for sure. Bigger. For sure. So knowing knowing all of this now like when you do, do you, when you do stop skating and performing what do you think you will want to do after that what right you um next? you know funny you said you're like you said you're not performing as much anymore um but yeah like that does at some point happen right for those of us that do extreme sports for a living i think skaters tend to like live a little bit longer than like a dancer even in our sports often and so we're really fortunate but <clears throat> i really do think i would go back to music and back into acting more um and so it's like i'll still be performing but i feel like that obviously there'd be more longevity you know in those because of it's not as hard on the body yeah, there, def there comes a point where you have to stop using your body and then you have to use your brain. If you've been a performer, uh, you can you can coach. A lot of skaters, ice skaters, they, they coach. Uh, they carry on doing that. But it's uh, it's always navigating that path of, okay, what should we go? What are we going to do next? What are we going to do? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, and then opportunities come along. Like for me with Dan and One Blades and what's happening there, you know, you know, you just never know. You've got to put yourself out there. Otherwise, people are not going to see you and pick you and go, oh, you've got an idea. I've got an idea with you uh, that we could do, you know, et cetera. So yeah. something I think you're right by putting yourself out there and like with Roller Jam, this being my sort of second major reality TV show um, and being at the awards ceremony the other night, it was sort of like, whoa. Maybe this is like, I never, you know, being a person that studied theater in school, like, you know, that was before reality TV was a thing. And I never would have like thought of myself as being a reality TV actress. Like I would have sort of had a judgment towards that. But like at that award ceremony, it just kind of occurred to me, like, maybe this is like, maybe I should consider this because I'm good with creating dialogue. I'm a songwriter. You know, I can come up with stuff on the fly. I can memorize dialogue quickly. Like I know how to act and where the cameras are and stuff. So maybe, you know, why, why should we limit ourselves? You know, a hundred percent. If you, if you could do multiple things, I, I say, try them all, see which works the best and then kind of laser focus onto those. Uh, you know, it's when you only do one thing, I did one thing for a long time. I was just a nice, I say just I was an ice skater traveling the world for 20 years and then when it started moving into different things and then kind of narrow widen my focus onto too many things the past few years but then figured out what i want to do and then how i can kind of have a positive impact back into skating in different different avenues that doesn't take up too much time but you don't know until you try lots of things yeah you can't, i you think you imagine right. you know it's you have to try and, and even the things that don't stick might end up having a purpose. Like, uh, for example, the aerial training that I did, you know, people rarely see me on the aerial trapeze or the hoop, 
but that certainly comes into play for all the acrobatic skating I do, right? Like it was, that's why I, even though I'm a taller girl, there was really not much of a problem for people to lift me because I already had built so much strength and stability from the trapeze act, you know? No, definitely, definitely. Okay, let's, let's talk about something funny. So what's, let, let's talk about a performance where it just, it just something went wrong like the lights went off or the music went off or some you know just something happened like does anything come to mind when i when i ask you this yeah i mean isn't like on one hand i'm like isn't that every performance and as a performer you just like are sort of like learning to like live within those those moments but um thinking of and in particular like a particularly funny story there's one i don't know why nothing's coming to mind right now um of something well actually yeah during roller jam you know um as i i aforementioned that i was newly transitioning into the day of flies which are a lighter skate and junior and i did not have very long to rehearse those stunts we had about a total of an hour to rehearse all four stunts so 15 minutes per stunt is all we had prior to the show and you know as you know like the stunts are kind of standard and you know there's a language and but him and i had different entrances and exits i'm sure you understand that as well you know for the stunts so we kind of had to like amalgamate like my entrance and his entrance into the stunt you know when with the show the pieces were only a minute and a half so it had to be like get in the stunt get out the stunt super quick and efficient um <clears throat> so we're doing the back bend u-turn stunt and with the way I started with Trey is like we're held by hands and then I have my leg thread through this <clears throat> and then I push off that leg and this is like because of my trapeze training I do it like as if I was in the hoop I push off that leg and then I hook this foot onto like his arm then I hook this arm and push out into the like pagoda into the back bend position but Something between <laughs> something between junior speed that he was going. Normally when I do it, like I hook this foot and then I feed this foot through and then I kind of push off the hip slightly of the skater in order to get into that back bend. But um, Junior's got such an amazing fast spin that like there was no hip to be pushed off of. It was like I was so far away from his hip. And my skates were so light that it was crazy that like what happened was when I went to hook this one hooked and then when I let go to hook this one this skate didn't have enough weight that I actually lost the hook and we were like I was just free floating like there was literally I was upside down with nothing connected to him but my hands and we were both like f word f word you know here we are like God. we were just like oh my god and and he goes i got you do whatever you have to do so i had to take my one of my feet reach back through as far as i could to get to his hip to push off of his hip so that i could then push myself in catch myself in midair you know again it was like a trapeze artist like i totally did it more like a trapeze artist you know catch myself midair hit, hit in all while the camera was on you and mind you this this was the time that they had the like moving camera close up on us and if you watch this you can actually kind of see quite a lot of this yeah oh no really have to show. you know but in in some ways i'm like well at least you can tell like like it's not like oh a magic trick he doesn't just do this and i go into it at least you can tell that there's you know work but yeah that was him and I were both like, oh my God, like I was just like, just flying in the air with no connection. I mean, our hands, but you understand what I mean. Like yeah. I could have very easily fallen out, you know, but it was it, again coming. And this is why I tell people if they're interested in doing the roller skate stunts and you're a female, go start training trapeze, like go get on aerial silk, go learn that apparatus because that gives you the strength so that you can work with people yeah. and the knowledge of the body awareness and yeah. all of that. a lot of a lot of the positions you know it's like oh, are you doing splits this way are you in this position it's very very similar apart from now someone is holding you in these positions correct absolutely you know? 
yeah, like I said, like that one's like the pagoda, you know, in the, the aerial hoop, we call that move the pagoda. And then, you know, it's like the aerial silk split that I do off that. And you're right, it really is, you know, it's, um, I, I always say my favorite apparatus is Trey, you know, or a guy. Yeah. Um, like, cause it's like, I prefer it. I don't, I like being closer to the ground. Um, but like, also like you guys are softer, <laughs> you know, like the trappies and the aerial hoop hurt, you know, they're, oh, they're yeah. very hard. And, um, but with that being said, like you guys also comparatively, um, I have to be hyper aware of the movements. Like when I transitioned from trapeze to the skate act, Trey had a lot of like, you can't just swing your arm out, Kim, you know, like, cause he's not an aerial hoop and aerial hoop could take it. Like I could do that and the aerial hoop would take it. But for a person on skates, if I do that, like that's gonna, that could throw them off their feet. Right. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a transition there where I had to kind of learn, but for the most part, it's about the same. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you like uh, being the flyer? I love flying. Yeah, I love it. And uh, but I'm kind of okay with basing too. And and like um, I've been basing like you know I, I'm in the land of flyers. Like I think I'm kind of like rather big. I'm five seven, and you know I, I weigh about one eighteen, one fifteen. And you know so I've been recently flying like the little five foot five two. You know like 100 pound, 108 pound girls and like Ash, you know? And it's like, I'm like, oh, this is really quite easy. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's really, as you know, it's it's about um, your foot. It's more about your edge ability than your physical strength, you know, with a lot of these stunts. And so I never like, like as a cheerleader or whatever, I never would have, I never really liked to base. Like I never would feel comfortable putting like a 108 girl on me, you know, cause that's only like, eight pound different than me you know what i mean that's almost about the same as myself right. but um but with the skates i'm actually really starting to like it a lot because it's like it really has a lot more to do with this triple force and the counterbalances and i'm like oh like i kind of feel boss now you know i'm like yeah, yeah. Oh. Kind of <laughs> when, you know when junior you know it was obviously terrible when junior got hurt on so many levels, but it was really rather fun to sort of find myself as a base a little bit. In that Interesting. Process. So how, how do you find the dizziness between do, being a base and then being in the air? Like, what is it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nowhere the same. You guys have it easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's no, <laughs> that's funny. It's funny you bring that up because it's nowhere the same at all. Yeah, um, especially, you know, it depends on like, certain as a flyer certain things are worse like the the you turn the the back bend one like that one is hands down probably the hardest one on my stomach because it's like you go from like one position to another and then even like depending on how bendy you are even to another so your head kind of goes from like upright to this to this and to this and you're kind of like Ugh, and then you flop back out all of those while spinning um another one that's like that's really hard or like ones any ones in which like my partner is in charge of when i'm changing my head space in the air so like like if you're doing like a transitional type stunt where you're combining like three stunts you know and as you know the partners often like the base is kind of i don't know about you but for me the base is always in charge like i'm always kind of for the most part the base is in charge yeah. and so <clears throat> you know if he says if he's ready to flip you into that next stunt he does it he gives you a warning normally it's like a hop so you know it's gonna happen, but it's always kind of like, oh, like when you transition from like right side up to upside down or bendy to lefty or splitty to bendy or whatever, those transitions, those are like the ones. And, yeah. Yeah, I um, lost I, my cookies a lot, you know. It's yeah. Easy. yeah, the the only reason I ask is like after all of these years, I, I was in the park with my daughter and you know these, these like, you just sit on it and you go do this in the center and you spin around and I was spinning around and I put my head back and I was like, oh, oh my God, I feel ill. I thought. That's exactly the that moment. And Natalia was over there skating. Uh, uh -huh. So I went over and I explained it to her and she said, yes, that's how I feel. And I said, what is wrong with you? Why right. would you do that? <laughs> you know, absolutely, now, absolutely I think, correct. now I think back to some of the things that I've done to people where I'm literally <laughs> like with Diana, okay, we're going to start here. Then we're going to go here. We do like nine different positions. Those are the ones that but get you. Me. 
no one in the I know place. and it's like especially because like you know and like Trey will be like huh and then it's like I'm not even you know you're upside down you can barely think you're like you know point your toes and it's up and then it's like oh like you just like get yeah. you know it's definitely and it's funny because these, these neck spins as well it's like the <laughs> neck spin doesn't bother me I don't know and I know a lot of people have trouble with that and I don't know if it's because I did so much neck spin training as a trapeze artist before I started doing neck spinning on a skater and so it of anything is the most similar to trapeze because it's like the same center whereas the rest of them I'm going from an orb like a centered to an orbital spin you know that one there's a center spin but mm. I'm not super great at that trick though because I'm so long and lean you know, I'm so my line is so long, so any little bitty bend in my line really creates yeah. an orbit, you know. So that's a, like that's a trick that if I was in a quartet, like I'm always kind of happy to pass on, but at the same hand, if the other person doesn't like it, I'll practice that one at the end of time and it does not bother me at all. Mm. But is there any tricks that you've that you you've never done and you're like God, Yeah, headbanger. Try that one. Can you believe it? I've never done headbanger. I've almost done headbanger. One, like a little one, baby uh, headbanger. One where you have the legs here. Or the, yeah, or the uh huh. Legs. Right, exactly. Or here, or you hold the ankle. This yeah. version, right. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan like has done baby headbanger with me, but that's just one that, quite honestly, I'm too tall. You know, like Ryan's six five, so that works. Yeah. Um, but like you have to, you have to have your legs so that this is this is my, this is the body. You have to have your legs so they're like sticking out the back. Correct. It, I could not, do that. It's really. not aesthetically pleasing, but that's the only way you could get away with it without hitting your head. Without the exactly, yeah. you're right, and but, and I think as well, like um, there's just i think there's like you know when you're dealing with the stunt groups there's kind of like different types of um tricks right there's some tricks that are um like non-contortionist tricks and there's some tricks that are contortionist tricks yeah and because i'm a contortionist we're always going to kind of not do the ones that are not contortionist tricks we're going to do the contortionist tricks so you only have you know what five seven tricks of stunt show exactly. so we're not going to do even though headbanger is a big trick it's going to be better for us to do one where i'm in a split because that's actually what the crowd really wants oh, exactly. to do. I mean, this is this was always hard for me it's like what tricks do we do i want to i've got to i do them all like what, what do we pick? You have, then you try to pick ones that don't look different. So you've got one one head, then you might have a, something with a split, then you've got something upside down, then you've got a net. You have to try to, because the average Joe has no idea what you're doing. Like right. when Duo Transcend doing their, their tra trapeze, I have no idea what they're doing. I don't know the names of the tricks. I don't know what they're supposed to look like. It just looks pretty cool and dangerous. That's what it looks like when we do stuff. For a normal person, they're like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, that was cool too. We're like, that's harder. They're like, wait, well, looks. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that it's different for the guys and girls too. I think for the stunt base, some tricks are harder, and for the flyer, it's a totally different trick that's harder. Oh, you know, like so some of the easiest tricks for me are the hardest for my base, and vice versa. Some of the easiest for them are the hardest for me. Yeah. you know so it's kind of it's like and then you have to and then i think each stunt pair sort of has tricks that work like um you know anything with me doing the splits is always going to work people always want to see that trick over anything else so we're going to throw as many splits tricks as we can in for me you know and then like you deal with somebody else who maybe like their back Ben's amazing you know then like those are going to be the tricks you want to highlight let's talk about one blaze for a second although we can't talk about exactly what we're doing just yet just yet very soon we'll be able to show you everything but for now all you need to know is we're creating ice inline and quad blades they've all been developed at the same time which is the first time a skating company has done this and they're being created by dan nicholson the founder of Ultima. He's created something that no one could ever, ever imagine. The really close friends that I've spoken to and I've shown what we've got, they really just cannot believe that this is something that's going to be available to skaters in the near future. So for now, either go enjoy show skaters or go down below, 
join our mailing list and then you'll be the first to hear about our pre-orders which will most likely have 40% off and you'll hear about this through the emails. There's also going to be some great competitions to win yourself a free pair of ice inline or quad blades and you'll hear about how to become an affiliate and start earning through one blades as well because one of the main key things we want to do with this company is to reward skaters instead of a company just making money and just keep no we want you guys to win with us as we create a massive company we're going to be doing a lot of things that help skating grow and help skaters in general and help underprivileged skaters there's so many great plans that we've got here i'm using all of my experience in crypto to bring this ethos and these ideas of rewarding people into our skating company so go and sign up for show skaters or our mailing list to be the first to hear about everything now back to the show we're going to kind of slowly come towards the the end here uh, okay Got four, four more kind of questions, uh, you know, more like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't can't find the word. Inspirational, kind of this this kind of vibe. And then we'll have a few quick fire questions at the end. Okay. Uh, off you go. All right. So uh, can you share a favorite story or lesson from your journey that could inspire uh, our listeners or, uh, you know, some of your students or something like this? Yeah, uh, favorite story, something that's inspiring. Hmm. Um, well, let me think about this. Um, I think, I think that in general, it's like maybe not so much a story as it is like, the story of my life, <laughs> you know, um, if you just fall by following the inspirations that you have and sort of continuing to put yourself in situations that feel good and continuing, just continuing the process of training yourself, um, physically, mentally, you know, if you just keep down the path, I really do believe it eventually seems to all make sense. And like when I started training and putting out my tutorial programs, like I could, I could tell I was helping people and that it was actually making sense to them. And I knew it was because of, I trained engineering because I trained yoga, you know, and because I was an artistic figure skater and because I had been with p -Funk all those years. So I have like a musicality that they taught me, you know? So you just never really know if you just do the things that you're feeling called to, you never really know when they're going to come into play, but they will. Um, just recently performing for the reality TV awards. A great example. I went to a party, my friend Soli, I've known him forever, musician, and he, he's married to Alanis Morissette. He had this amazing festival, Soli Fest. I went to it and I ran into a woman that knew me from my old music career, but she also was a roller skater and was watching Roller Jam and she produced, helped produce the reality TV awards. And she said, hey, do you want to come walk the red carpet? And I said, sure. And then lo and behold, long story short, Jojo Siwa was going to perform and then like ended up not being a performer, was going to be a presenter instead. And they needed a performer. And my friend was like, oh, well, Kim used to be a singer. Why don't we have her come sing? So like, right. So then they contact me and I'm like, yeah, well, maybe I could get some of the roller jam people to come too, you know? So and I, they're like, well, if you bring the roller jam, you know, if you come and sing, we'll give you guys a table and the red carpet and blah, blah, blah. And so then I put it out in the message, anyone in roller jam want to come? And then like a couple of the girls did. So, you know, the process ended up with me singing with a love mic, with my seer will, with two roller skaters, us doing stunts and then them doing like skating around me the whole time. And if it wasn't for the like, 
10 years on the road with P-Funk, I wouldn't have been able to have all the technical conversations with them. They, they were playing my video on the background in which like I had the instrumental version that I edited to it. I wouldn't have known how to handle all of those questions. I wouldn't have known how to make sure I had a lav mic that I had them turn on and off when I was doing the stunts and then turning on when I sing. All of these like little bitty details that came together into this sort of like amazing moment for me really were like, like they say 20 years or whatever of experience and things that I thought I always like joke around that like I'm the great American failure you know like I had the great American dream but like none of them really like they all kind of seem to fail but even your failures you never know like when those failures are going to come into place and here I am being a reality tv star but actually mm, yeah skill sets as a musician and a skater and a director and a you know technical person right oh, without a manager or a team i didn't need you know because of that experience all those failures uh, you can't buy experience you can't learn it you have to have it you know it's like I, i'm the same there's many things that it's like it didn't do what i wanted it to do but now i have that now i have that experience and now i can actually it may be content that now I use for something else so it's uh it's good to have just tried and failed and learned lots and lots of things because then at the end of your life you know how to do a lot of things and you can connect them together from different worlds so yeah that's, oh. right. that's exactly it you know they, these kind of questions it's I love it when like the the guest just pauses for a second and then your memory you go deep into your memory because this is good for you this is good for you because now you're going to find something so authentic that you're like, what is it? And then you go on a journey. And that was, uh, that was special. That was special. I don't need to ask the next question. So I'm not going to ask you because it's very, very similar, but this is something I personally think about a lot. I think about this so much for myself of what I am, what do I want my legacy to be? What am I trying to achieve with all of the different things and the moves and what I've done and where I'm trying to go? You know, what do I want to leave back when I stop and look back on my time in skating? So for you, what is what legacy would you like to leave uh, when you close the book of Kim skating, for example, or Kim dead to <laughs> the end? Right? Yeah, I mean, I always kind of, as a musician, I came in it like wanting to be an activist. And I remember George Clinton, my boss, would always tell me, like, don't do that, Kim. Like, you don't want to walk down that path. And I, I was actually, a lot of my music's very social political still to this day. I kind of veered away from like straight activism and kind of moved more towards like social politicism. But even that, I'm like, now wondering if that's even like the landscape that I want to be in. Like, I'm just like, so it almost feels like trying to affect the world by like politics is like child's play, you know, like that's like a waste of my time. And I also had this like overall goal of being like inspiring people. Literally, that was my goal. Just like I wanted to inspire people. And um, I that is definitely still a goal. Like I want people to be able to like, think outside of the box and just like if you feel called to do something just do it and to follow those inspirations um but i also think that there's like as i i think this happens to all um <clears throat> high risk artists as we become more and more dangerous in our skill sets we become more and more risk averse and um i really would like to leave as the legacy of safety and it's so funny because it's like the things I do are so dangerous but like I want to leave a legacy of safety and so I don't know like that would be the legacy that I'm still kind of like trying to work on and like I'm teaching people to fall you know that's a very important aspect of skating learning how to fall but now just trying to figure out how we keep people inspired like but they're not just going home and trying these stunts on their own you know like things like that they're understanding the like the steps it takes to get to the points you know so i guess that would be the legacies i'd want to leave safety safety first safety first safety yeah. first yeah like yeah. safety first inspiration second yeah no 
I mean, this is great. Like, you know, when you say oh, what we're doing is dangerous, like some people could say what I have done, all the things I've done is dangerous. It never felt dangerous when I was doing it. I always felt in control. And I look, I watch some of my videos back and go, you're really doing that in a storm drain in Vegas during COVID. What if you had an accident and then you've got to go to the hospital? I look back on myself and I'm like, you must have been like, <laughs> oh, no. Like sort of a, well, you know, um, I think that one thing, that's how I want my base to feel, always in control, you know? And I feel like that's the difference between like a base and a flyer fundamentally is yeah. that flyers are like, I trust you, do whatever. And bases are like, I trust me, you know? And like, like that's the, that's a working relationship. And so that's always a good thing, but I do know what you mean. And like with Trey, when him and I first started stunting together, he'd be like, I feel like you're not like aware of like the risk factor, you know, that we're doing. And then, we um we took a fall because we were it was the early days of that stupid vinyl wrap that they were putting on all the floor for events right mm -hmm. and we showed up to a our wooden tap floor being the vinyl wrap tap floor and we tried like a basic stunt on it and slipped and after that fall i became very aware of how dangerous and actually there was like a whole there was a whole six months that i was like paralyzed in the stunts until the last stunt and then all of a sudden kim would come out you know the whole show I yeah, yeah 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 kim and then the last stunt you'd see kim like come out you know so um you know there is yeah i don't think people just i mean you can kind of i think when you see it up close you kind of understand obviously we like have trained ourselves to levels that are like our lines are so perfect and we land so clean that like you don't understand but i always thought that that motorcycle and the globe act you know i always figured well that's the more if there's a more dangerous than us act it's that one and then i was at sturgis this year and the globe act guy him and i were talking and i was like Oh, you know, because I was doing aerial hoop at his stage a lot. So, you know, he knew me as the aerial hoop girl. And I was like, yeah, you know, but actually I do the skate act. That's my main thing. He goes, you do the duo skate act? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, well, that's the most dangerous act in circus. <laughs> and I was like, wait, but I thought yours was. And he's like, oh, no, no. As long as our globe's good, it's fine. You know, you what, what you guys do is crazy, you know. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, my God. That's, that's like yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird. It's weird because you only know what you can do. So then you don't know the people that can't even skate. It's like, how? How are you doing that? You know, so it's a, you need someone that can do everything. And then maybe they'll have an opinion. But once you master anything, it's easy. Right. You know, like when I was doing my tricks and stuff, it's, it, it, they're all easy. There's not one, oh, that's harder. Oh, it's a bit more effort. But it's still easy because I've practiced it too many times. I'm bored of it now, <laughs> you know. That's correct. Well, and there, that is also a part of it. Like, I feel more confident doing the skate act than I do with trapeze and sear wheel. Um, well, maybe not the sear wheel. I'm beginning to trust it. But um, def but actually, yes, definitely the skate act because we know how long we've been skating. We know how well we trust our skates. And even though it's not my skates, it's your skates that yeah. I'm trusting. I trust your skates because I know how long you've been skating. And it, even though it is a riskier thing to us, it actually feels more secure because of how long we've been doing it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely uh, check your nuts and bolts and screws before you're skating. I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you a funny story now, right? So. I always used to check them before we before we skated. So the BGT audition, when I came off and I was skating, I'm like, God, something's wrong with my wheel. I'm like, I've lost, I'm like, and I looked down and one of the wheels, one side, it had just come out. I'd lost one screw. But so it, you only I, had three wheels on one skate? No, there was there was still all four wheels, but one side had come off and oh. it was just like dig 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 dig. And oh, I was like, when I, but I didn't feel it at all on the stage. We did the head, we did everything. I came off and then I was skating. I'm like, what if it came off just a bit earlier? That could have been horrific. Disaster. That would, yeah. have, been great. That would have been great TV. <laughs> well, and that's back to the, like I said, the riskier the are, that we are, the more risk adverse that we become.
Yeah. And it's like, you know, you stop wearing bobby pins. You know, you st- like for Roller Jam, whenever we had to tell them our costume, like we talked to the costume department, they were like, oh, is there anything we didn't know? And it was like, actually, <laughs> you can imagine. We opened the paragraph and it's like, and we need from here to here, skin exposed and nothing on our necks. And we need from knee down exposed and we need nothing, no scratchy things on our lower back and no sequins and no, you know. Yeah. So- like the the high level of like things that we have to keep all these risk factors out of our show because our show itself is the risk factor. Oh, definitely. I mean, I have I've had accidents probably five maybe in my whole career that I that I actual oh you know I slipped on something or slipped or you know but very few. But if I think the amount of that I've actually done, which uh, I'm quite grateful. Yeah, for. that's a great point is like there there is no this doing this the centripetal for stunts that we do there is no experimentation there should never be no accidents there should never be no oh you know like sure it's okay for two people that are very experienced to try a new stunt but there should never be like two people that have never tried a new stunt and they're both trying it together like that. Oh, that's, that's a never this know. Is, this is what's <laughs> tough when you have two people that are learning together at the same time. So both of them don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it as opposed to I go and teach someone and I teach right. them everything. So they learn from someone that's done it for years. Correct. Vice versa. You know, it's like, but it's not always easy to find someone that will teach you or that will do it for free or yeah. that you can afford to pay. Or it's very, it's very hard. Like I learned pairs in it when I was in an ice show as a single skater and you start learning a bit here, learning a few lifts. And I didn't do anything on the ice. I started doing lifts from when I was like 18, 19. I didn't actually become a pair until 28. Then I got a partner and I went on that journey. Before then, I just did the other lift here and there. So I was always scared. I didn't dare do it on the ice. I was scared. I was like, oh, no, I get scared. So I didn't do it until 28. <laughs> wow. But I mean, yeah. you must have had like a girl or somebody that was able to teach you the new. Well, well, I've been learning along the way. And then at 28, I wanted to go and work for Royal Caribbean uh, on the cruise ships. I, I couldn't do triples. They said, well, maybe get a, get a girl and learn pairs. So I got a girl, I learned pairs, and I went on tour. And two years later, I got on the cruise ship. This was always for me like there was a block and I'm like, okay, I'll figure it out. You know, it's like it's it's always been like that for me. When I finished, uh, I got injured on on the on the cruise ship. I got injured on the cruise ship. I came off uh, after four months. I had a PRP injection. They it fixed my arm, but then they wouldn't take me back. And wow. then, then I went into inline figure skating, and then went and did Ramonia's Got Talent, and went on this whole journey. If I didn't get injured. Oh, they took me back. I would never have gone on to inlines. I would have just stayed on the cruise ship, uh, cashing my you know tax free checks for as long as I could. So it was the biggest and the best thing that ever happened to me that injury, and then them not letting me back on there because I wouldn't be. It wouldn't be here now, would I? I would have done a total. Right. Everything I'm known for now is because of that injury. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's back to sometimes how your failures are like guiding guiding you just as well as your successes yeah. none of us like it whenever no. <laughs> things don't go I our mean, way but I mean, sometimes they're still going our way yeah i mean all, all all my injuries they're all like from stupid things you know Stu- stupid things uh i mean it's, it is what it is I, i've never had an actual injury where i just oh i just fell and hurt myself no you were doing something stupid and you got injured Every time it's like God or you know, someone has gone, Oh, just go and do something stupid. Like when I was in Disney 24, I can't do the splits. I'm like, I want to do the box splits spinning down the ice. Yeah, I tore the, the cartilage of my hip. Luckily, Salt Lake City was the next city. I went to a specialist. They said, Okay, you need to have an operation or something, or you need to rest it, etc. So I left the left tour, went home and uh, rested for like a month and then was seeing a physio it got better a month after that i got into the, the show in my hometown hot ice which was the goal of my life that was my goal at 13 i want to do that show and then i got to do it at 24 so i i achieved my my goal and then went crazy yeah. because like that was another injury you know so it's it's uh 
you know, it's life doesn't make sense going forward. It only makes sense when you look back. You look back and you go, you connect the dots. Oh, this, 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 this. It's it's crazy to look back. It's so interesting to look back on your own life. I feel Absolutely. I mean, like uh, this opportunity I had with the reality TV awards to sing. Like, arguably, if I just kept being a musician all this time, like that opportunity wouldn't have came. That opportunity became because I was a skater and because I was a skater, I got on a reality show. And it was because of those things that I was offered the opportunity to sing. Isn't that weird? Very strange. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to like just quit banging. Like if you're just banging the door down and you're banging the door down and the door won't seem to bang down, sometimes you just got to go ahead and like walk down the hall and find some other doors. Oh yeah, pivot, 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 pivot. As Ross said, pivot, pivot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That door might be open later. Yeah, okay, so last question. Yeah. Last question, so what advice would you give to someone who's hesitant to start roller skating, perhaps due to a fear or, or injury or lack of confidence? Learn to fall. I think that, <clears throat> As an adult, if you're learning to skate, I think that it's of most importance that you spend copious amount of time practicing falling every time you skate. Literally, like when you first put on your skates, every time like you do 20 falls, like on purpose, standing there on the carpet. Um, and you do that for like a year or two years. Um, we, as children, we had the opportunity to learn to fall when we were like little bitty people and had green bones. So we got to like learn to fall and skate at the same time. You know, we skate, we fall, we skate, we fall, we skate, we fall. But I think that when you're an adult and you're learning to skate, you need to teach yourself consciously how to fall before you actually start really trying to skate. Because, um, you know, in the incident that you do fall, which you will fall, you want it to already kind of be second nature, like it is for us. Like we got to build it in as children because falling on skates is different than it is in like natural world. You know, everyone kind of wants to reach up instead of thinking of going down, you know? So um, that's, I think the main thing. And, and I see it over and over again when I teach people to fall, I see them go from this person when they're skating to like, oh, well, okay, actually, if I do fall, it's not so bad. And I just have to get my butt lower to the ground. And now, I, you know, because if you're sitting there worrying about falling when you're skating, then you're not think then you're not thinking about skating, you're thinking about not falling. So you have to first get yourself to where you're not thinking about falling. Very, very good advice. Very, very good advice. <laughs> I'd say that goes for life as well. Learn to fall. Learn to fail, learn to fall. Great. Yeah, I guess that's been like a key like statement of this particular performance or this particular podcast with you today has been really about, you know, failure and just it's a part of it. You know, and it really it's, there's no other better way of learning that in skating. Like guaranteed your favorite skaters are your favorite followers. Oh. You know, like the better you skate, the better you fall. You can't like, especially like at my age, like the only reason that I'm still even trying to compete and do things is because I can fall so well, you know, like otherwise I'd be breaking a hip. Exactly. Exactly. So let's, let, let's have a few rapid fire questions. So these are not like, mm, ha, ha. it's like just, okay. Oh yeah. Like they're, they're a bit, they're a bit silly, they're a bit fun. Uh, what's the first thing you do in the morning? Uh, drink water. <laughs> Really? Okay. After that, I don't know. I kind of stretch a little, pet my cat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Uh, tea. What's your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Um, I like staying up late at night. Okay. Uh, what's the best purchase you've ever made under one hundred dollars? The best purchase under a hundred dollars. Deer whistles for my car. <laughs> what does that say about me? What are deer whistles? They're these things you put on your car so that it's like a high pitched whistle so that the deers hear you so you won't hit them. 
Whoa. Okay. See, you want to go get some deer whistles too? I don't think I need them here in Poland. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Yeah. That's uh, what I, you learn a lot about me from that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what's one thing you'd bring to a desert island? Oh, desert island, a, a life straw. <laughs> a life straw. Can, can I can I bring a GD? We have unlimited wishes. <laughs> oh god oh kim it's been amazing finally <laughs> finally we, we we got to sit down and have a conversation yes and i'm so grateful yeah it's been really nice is there, is there anything that we've kind of missed or is there any questions that you kind of have for me before uh before we drop off um yeah well you know, I'm very excited to hear. I don't know if you can talk about it, but I'm very excited to hear about your new skate idea. And um, you know, I I'm. Are you excited about transitioning from like performer into like business person? I guess. Oh, well, I can't tell you uh, much about it really. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, that's weird that the camera starts going flashing off. It's like, don't say anything. Yeah, I, so oh, I can't. Okay. Well, then, I can't, oh, look, it's doing it again. <laughs> yeah. Well, then never mind. Uh, you want to answer yeah. that question? No, I, I can't <laughs> talk anything about it. All I can say is we're doing ice, inline, and, and quads. You know, we're, we're, we're doing all three. They've all been created and invented at the same time, which I think is the first skating company in history to do that, to do all three. But there's, there's more to it than that. But what's been really tough for me is the business side, you know, the patents, setting up the company, the company structure, you know, looking to uh, grow the team as we go forward and, you know, estimates and territories and, you know, affiliates and tax. And this all comes oh, back into my, into my crypto project, which I have. You know, which I've been doing crypto now for three years, and my this is going to be done through my crypto project. Oh. You know, so this is, it's all I've managed to, you know, leave skating for you know for a long time, go into crypto, come back to skating, and now blend blend, blend both worlds together. Because in crypto, I've you know I've got like a few different accounts, multiple projects, and I'm Adam J over there, and then over here oh. I'm Adam Jukes, the the roller skater, ice skater. So it's two different worlds that become one. It's what, what's quite crazy for me is the realizations with calling the company one, one blades, because one was created from two NFT projects that I had. We created them into one project and we went through loads and loads of names and we just called it project one. And then when we, I met Dan and then we decided to do the skates and I decided to do it through my crypto project and was like, Let's call it one because it was going to be ice and inline to become one again. But then when I look at myself, I was born on the first day of the first month in 1981. So there's always been one around things that I've always done. I've always tried to be the number one or be the yeah. first. So it's the fact that it's it is one now. It's like this is quite quite crazy, you know. So yeah, it's it's a lot it's of work like it's all coming circular back to one for yeah you. it's a lot of work and it's a lot of new work but it's really exciting i like finding new mountains where there's so much to learn and so much growth yes it's daunting yes it's hard and i sit some days i'm like oh, i hope this works right i hope this works and then dan sends me over something and i'm like oh my god is this really my life is this right, really pinch me moment like... you know, well the, the the impact that we're going to have on skating is unprecedented it's unprecedented what's going to happen and then for me as a person that loves crypto and i've been there for three years which is like being in something for 10 years because it's 24 7 it never stops i'm going to have an impact for cardano which is the blockchain that i'm on because, oh, yeah. you know when this when these skates are in the olympics and worlds and the commentators are talking about our plates and they're from a, a crypto project on cardano this is huge it's really big for me you know cardano is going to become so much bigger like our founder was you know meeting with elon musk and rfk he may become the crypto advisor for america 
well, this brings even more eyes on Cardano. And we're mm -hmm. at my God, I picked the right shade. I picked the yeah. right shade. I have Cardano you know. too. I mean, I you don't do? Know. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I've actually been into crypto since like 2016 or so. So, yeah. <laughs> oh my god we, we did we did i didn't know we could have talked about crypto oh well i mean i'm not saying i'm a crypto expert but i just bought in long enough that it's working out for me <laughs> you know oh, 2016 yeah a long time ago and i wish i would have got in earlier because i knew about it earlier i just couldn't figure oh. out how to buy it. oh I wish, but I, wish, I wish i could get it get in a time machine or go back and tell my younger self btc eth ada xrp you know the, get into these early and just buy as like bitcoin buy as much as you can you know absolutely i think when i first learned about it it was eight dollars a coin for a bitcoin I know. I know and now it's like 98 could be 99 is it yeah oh, hey I, I haven't looked at my uh my portfolio for a while good to yeah, hear it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna hit 100k in the next days if well, if, if if not if not today, I mean, let me just go quickly look because it is, it's getting up there, uh, $98,000. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. Did you say it's at 98? 98? $98,000. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm glad I, you know, I've uh, been dealing a lot with my mother's estate and dealing with the wake of my mother's death. And I almost did have to sell my crypto and I decided not to. Um, oh, you don't want to. I didn't. <laughs> God, well, especially Cardano's got up over one hundred and thirty-five percent in the past few weeks. Oh wow! Yeah, I've got a substantial amount of Cardano. So that's great. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, all right. Well, I'm gonna let you go then. Um, while they work on my house here. Sorry about the interruptions. It's all good. It's all good. It's been amazing to catch up with you. We'll definitely have to do this again in the future. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself, Kim. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. There you have it, guys. Podcast 11 is done with Kim Manning. Uh, that was really, really fun to do. Uh, we had a few little interrupt interruptions there. Uh, we had to skip through some bits. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And I'll see you guys in the next one. And make sure that you do go and join showskaters.com down below. It's free. We're building a community learn to skate courses and lots and lots of more uh, stuff in there and make sure you are following one blades and instagram and facebook and join the mailing list which will be down below as well see you next time